might come through that to the overall vehicle. So, uh, uh, actually, we had a lot of fun with that, and if we can turn it over to the to our structures people, both at, at Marshall, Langley, and Ames, and, and uh, JSC, I think those guys would have a lot of fun with that. The other thing that you see there is the command and control observation deck and industrial airlock. These are slide-out units from the, the contiguous uh, first launch that comes up there. That's a technique that's been used in another aspect of our government, and uh, that's where I came from, that's old CIA and our O days. Um, stuff like that works. Anyway, it's a good way to get volume, especially if you want to uh, maintain a, a habitable environment on the inside. So that's the basic overview picture. Let's go to the next one. Now we're starting to get into a little bit of the details here, and you can see right off the bat the trans-tab type modules that we've uh, accommodated in the overall layout of the structure. Um, you see there, there is a, an annotation to the external dynamic ring flywheel. You can barely see it down there. Uh, you'll see our first demonstration on the ISS for a centrifuge, and it'll become a little bit more evident in the backup charts, and, and I'll show you that uh, if we have time. Uh, but that basically uh, takes out the, the, the mass rotation. Now, now understand, when we when we started sizing this, just the vehicle itself, you know, we took advantage of, of what we thought our throw weight from an HLV was going to be and how many launches we were going to have up there. So we kind of worked backwards from that, just like, like the LEM guys had to do, and said, okay, here's what we can come up with uh, with associated uh, rack. You also see a first sign there of what we call the... Uh, the exo truss system, which is the, the thrust and load, uh, load bearing uh, throughout the entire vehicle, and that's all integrated. Uh, how you how you join these type of structures on orbit to actually accommodate a thrust is, is going to be a little bit different than, than what we've learned with ISS, but nonetheless invaluable information and knowledge that we've gained from ISS. You also see a rendition at the back end there of let's call it a. Uh, a chemical type of, uh, of a propulsion unit that's going to get it from LEO up to L1. We have to transit that fairly quickly. And the notion is, would we have crew on board while we transited through the Van Allen boat? May or may not, but shoot, that's what MOD is here for, and they'll have a lot of fun with that. Uh, you can also see we've got startup thrusters to get our, our uh, 6 RPM up there. We have uh, you know, uh, COPV uh, on the outside of, of uh, the uh, access uh, tunnel there to go from the center carriage and core out out to the um, uh, outer outer ring. Now the the notion here is that we would do two things with with this artificial gravity. One, we would have uh, provisions for a standing exercise uh, right in the uh, the first hard collar that you see there uh, at the end of the transit tube with the little gold balls on it. Uh, that's because the uh, space and life science feels that we have to have vertical axial loads. Uh, the rest of it would be for uh, some some provision storage within that, and also uh, that's going to be uh, accommodating for uh, three crew members that are going to be in there. Uh, you can you can look at it and you say, well, gee, is it a is it a CG uh, axis balance type of a system? In other words, is it going to be off balance? And the answer is, uh, we're going to accommodate that uh, to some extent by using internal bladders for uh, shifting of fluids around. Some of those fluids could be, um, quote, waste products. Some could also be used for consumption, i.e. just water and other fluids for, for general processes on board. So we're thinking in that overall context of this has to be ultimately a balanced system and it has to be able to accommodate different different weight changes with crew going in and out of it. But bottom line here is that you have to address the need, what whatever the design is, for um, artificial gravity for the crew's health and also to accommodate GNC for the vehicle. All right, that's the next chart. And um, by the way, feel free to jump in and have a question and, and tell us we're not, because uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, we'll, we'll accommodate that as best we can. Here's a view looking from the aft section. Now you can see the little, uh, quote, um, external tank-ish type of colored uh, 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 propellant containers there. Uh, that's what we call our universal integration platform for the propulsion model. And, and that's where we accept the load. Uh, we have uh, all control goes, goes through that, and that's how we can accommodate a couple of different type of, of propulsion units, whether, whether it is chemical or whether it is SEP. You know, when we go in and design this, we're going we're gonna to have two different types of min-max that we'll, we'll use for, for load accommodation and, and, of course, the uh, uh, 
uh, the carriage and thrust bearings on the centrifuge are going to have to accommodate that as well as also the main cab structure that you see up there. You can also see off to the right, uh, we've got the door open on the industrial size airlock. And you can also see that with this trans tab unit here in the, in the foreground, or I'll call it trans tab ish, that, that's our equalist unit. And, and embedded in there is the entire equalist system for the whole vehicle. And it comes off of the center core, unfolds, active membranes, uh, regenerative uh, in, in nature. We've got a lot of scrubbers going on in there, ionization, water filtration, urine, urine extraction, you know, solids removal, etc. That goes on there. It's a big plant, and, um, and so we're going to have to accommodate that. The other two are basically logistical support, and you saw what those were referenced earlier, a lot of, you know, socks, food, uh, you know, clean underwear, uh, reading material, however you want to take a look at it, that's what we've got to stick in there. And I apologize for repeating quickly, but we're trying to get a lot in here for you all. Um, next, Matt. So, it says, well, that's really nice, and boy, I don't, you know, I don't exactly have uh, under $4 billion to give you this month, uh, so what else could you do? And the answer is, well, we've got to go off and have a demonstration of the centrifuge, and the best place that we can do that is on the International Space Station. Uh, taking a look with, with some uh, friends uh, here at JSC, and you can see what our, our range of cost is and what overall how we do this how we build and construct this. Um, uh, this can go up on, uh, uh, right now we're expect to go up on a, on a Delta II uh, as far as packaging goes, and the cost that you see down there obviously doesn't include the Delta II launch, but that's who we can go up with. You can see everybody gets a part of this, from you know, Draper's Lab to, to Glenn. Uh, we can even go uh, you know, all the way out to Annings, and, and you see that uh, this is something that will give us our, our first understanding of, of what a rotational mass, and it won't be that large, does to an understood and well-characterized GNC system, which is the International Space Station. And we've got a way, even uh, as we get into this, you can see how we can isolate ourselves so we don't have any problems with microgravity, uh, but we also get a, an invaluable amount of uh, engineering data that will come out of this. Um, Station life sciences uh, have have lobbied me <laughs> to make this actually bigger than what we started out with. Uh, we were going to keep it at, at uh, uh, 30 feet in diameter, um, and uh, it was primarily going to be an effort to, to just t uh, test out the seal design deployment techniques and what the overall impact on it was, and then we were actually going to be able to put astronauts into it. And they were going to pull about three-tenths of a G um, at 6 RPM, we could get up a little bit more at 10 RPM, but 6 because of Coriolis effects and some data we got from the Russians, because that's about the best that uh, we want to uh, embrace. Uh, that, that idea uh, spawned them to say that they really want some test data on, a, on as close to 1G as we can, and they also wanted a flat floor. Um, anyway, there's other renditions that, that address all that. A key aspect of this effort is that we're using existing hardware to make this happen, and one of the key pieces is the external airlock that currently accommodates and resides inside the uh, the orbiter. All we need is, need is one, so we've already got a docking system in the port there that we're going to accommodate, and we've talked to the space station folks. And Mac, I guess you said stuff that you need found is of interest, correct? Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the next chart. Uh, there's our challenges for the, uh, you know, going in and taking a look at, uh, at the overall space exploration vehicle uh, that we call MMSEV. That's multi-mission space exploration vehicle. It's not the multi-purpose uh, crew vehicle. This is different. This, the multi-purpose crew vehicle, or Orion, will, of course, uh, work with this and, and be a major part of, uh, you know, getting the crew home if, if that's the vehicle of choice. Uh, there may be a commercial option as well. It, it all, all depends. Uh, and you can read through that very quickly. Okay, Matt. Um, so, so here's partnering and collaboration for MMSEV. Uh, everything, uh, you know, kind of stands there. You can, you can see where and who would potentially be doing what. We're trying to make this a very large NASA endeavor. Uh, it, it unites most of NASA and take advantage uh, of, of all the expertise in, in all the centers and uh, we think it'd be pretty exciting. Next, Mac. Uh, 